Carlos Nelson with Cascade Media Group and What's Up Kansas City. And today we're going to talk some politics. We're going to talk some politics with someone that has uh, extensive uh, background, family background himself uh, in Kansas City politics. They had, he has deep roots. Who do we have here? Uh, Leonard Jonas Hughes IV. Uh, hey, hey, Jonas, I've been knowing you since yeah. you was in white shoes. Uh, indeed, because I know you know the drill. Run it on. Yeah. Here. Well, as you said before, I really was literally born on a pole, necessarily. Uh, even my father told me, he said, you're a campaign baby. It made me look good because he was the youngest man to ever win judge in the state of Missouri, which is why they changed the law and made Missouri's judge plan because a black man had upset the system. And so now from then on, the governor got to pick judges. And so I that- want hold it. What I want you to do, I, we, we're going to get well, no, I'm gonna your to dad. That. I want you going back to what Kenny Garden all the way up to where you're at and who the people. OK, are. And so that starts. I'm, I start on a pole. So I've been working the pole since I could walk. Kindergarten, St. Joseph's Catholic school, private school. My mother drops me off. She said I was the only kid that didn't look back. When she dropped me out, she, I said goodbye, and I walked into school. And the nun turned to her and said, I wish we had more kids like that. Well, she soon regretted that when I was running the whole class. But needless to say, I was able to have a top-notch education because my parents have always made sure that education was of the utmost. What was that like going to uh, uh, that school, uh, your 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 uh, early years. What grades was you in, uh, and what was the name of the school? St. Saint, Saint Joseph's, it came to St. Francis. All right, so and what so, grades were you in there till? From there, I was there from kindergarten to first grade, and there I felt fine, but when I went to St. Peter's from first grade to eighth grade, I was then one of one black person for until about sixth grade, and then there was three of us out of 39. All right, now uh, for my audience, run it down. If you can uh, bring back your feelings, what was it like going through middle school being a uh, uh, black person? Well, see, I always had a fundamental that I was different because even though I was going to St. Peter's, I lived on 40th in college. And so, I'm going to school during the day talking to kids who are laughing and playing. And some of them were my friends. But then there's a kid who every year pointed to the Niger River and would try and make a joke. And I get in trouble when I punch him. And so, oh, you know, but then I go home and I'm fighting because they say I talk like a white boy. And so I had to begin to develop and understand who I was. As as a man and, you know, as a person, because, for instance, we in the fifth grade, we began learning about the Civil War and I wanted to do Ulysses Grant as a general. But the teacher forced me to do one on Stonewall Jackson. And uh, and I asked her, you know, I said, why, well, you know, I, I don't want to be for the South. I don't want to learn anybody about that. And she said to me, you're not she said to this. Uh no, she was a she was just a normal teacher. No, I said you're not treasonous. I don't want to do one for the South. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, they well she made me, and she said, but you should always learn to study your enemy. And I and at the time, I didn't realize what she was talking about. But Miss Klein actually was hipping to me to understanding a way of that these are how some people think and you have to understand how they think in order to operate in a way where you should never be intimidated or frightened. Because like, you know, Stonewall Jackson was one of the few people who fought for the South but did not believe in its cause, but people, but he did what he had to do because that was then. And you know, but and also being in a Catholic school, 
it showed me how they viewed race even. Because they should have they even uh even do making me do that, I understand her with that, but there was no mention of the emancipation proclamation, you know. My father, my grandmother, and everybody else had made sure that I was given books to understand more about Harriet Tubman, to know who Nat Turner was, to know these things before they were even taught. Because history, it, 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 they taught, it skipped over. They mentioned the no, middle past. Uh, look, we can get off that subject because history has been whitewashed by the U Europeans. And but yeah, and that's the good this program was brought to you by DeCapos Cookies. Support your local bakers. Yes, that's the British. That was their greatest. That, those little island boat builders, that was their thing. Right, but, but here I'm in America, saying, we can, we can, so we're we going on. Yeah, we can we're moving moving. on. Uh, and as we get there, and uh, I remember one birthday in particular, I got NWA and a Guns N' Roses CD. How old and, I was uh, 11 years old. And so if you understand Guns N' Roses is heavy metal and NWA is rap and it gangster yeah, rap. Heavy rap. <laughs> you, you know, it was it. It was that rap that, you know, that my grandmother, I remember the first time she caught me listening to it. She said, what, boy, what did you listen to this, you know? And uh, uh, I remember saying, you know, oh, no, it's not mine, but. We understand now rap. People forget that summer when NWA released, there was also a single called Self Destruction and All in the Same Game. And it talked, the other songs were the pro black movement of rap. And those songs talked about heading for self destruction and staying away from gangs. But that summer is when the corporations and music decided that they were going to push an image with our music that has today become a predominant form of music and the way people see black culture. For instance, The Temptations, David Ruffin, his daddy was a pimp and so on and so forth, but they never sang about it or told about such things. They talked about, I Got Sunshine had talent, but come forward now, they've understood the power of creating narratives. And that music, and I brought up this Guns N' Roses in this NWA because understanding I was living in two different worlds until one person called me on it in both worlds. They said, how come you act this way when the black people come around? But when you this way, and I said, uh, huh. I said, because, and I told them, I said, well, frankly, I, I never noticed it. I talked to them because that's the way we talk. You know, it wasn't, I don't say, what's up, my brother? Because you a white boy. And, you know, who and so on and so forth. But living in these worlds and being taken in these families, I got to see, like, I remember going home one afternoon with a white friend, and they had a mayonnaise and sugar sandwich for their afternoon snack. Now, I thought they was playing. <laughs> like I, 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 you know, I understand that you know people have stuff, but people, I think black people don't understand that poverty exists on the other side as well. Sometimes we want to get make it seem like they 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 had a good run, but the one percent has always cared about the one percent, and we've got to understand that we have achieved and done more than any people on the face of the earth. There's no black man named Spartacus. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we won. And we have to look at our achievements now. Even, for instance, we're talking about police brutality. We need to be talking about it in the context of how it is a threat to America. Because it is not simply us that commits crime. You know, and I learned this when I got to high school. Let, let's move on on your history. Well, we, we okay, then now we'll get to high school. What I want to know, all right, what high school did you go to? I started off at Rockhurst. All right, what was that like? It's an all-boys Jesuit school. And it was the same people that I had been growing up with 
except now there was no girl. And uh, they had a... You How many began blacks to, was in, in your class, approximately? Were you the only... Uh, uh, there was nine of us. Huh? There was nine of us. How many? But there, there was only about 20 in the whole school. All right. Then... You know, and we all collected together and we knew each other. And uh, there was a few that, you know, it was an interesting experience, except oh, this is where, there? Uh, my rebellion began there. And uh, the Jesuits and I made a decision that we should part ways my sophomore year. I wanted to go to Lincoln High School. All right. So where did you because, end up at? Oh, I got banished to Blue Springs South. How did you like that experience? Let my second week there, they put a KKK card on my locker. And so what year was I, this? this is about 95. And so I went and drew a picture of a KKK person hanging from a tree and I taped it to my locker. And then I sat back and I waited to watch who walked by my locker. And wait until they ripped and see who would do something to it. Well, finally, this kid walks by, and I tell you, and I'm, there's nothing, his name was Bubba, and he and he had a letter jacket on, and he ripped it off. And so I said, it was you. And I said, why'd you put that on my locker? And he said, because you don't belong here, nigger. I said, pop! <laughs> I hit him once, and, he, and that was it. You know, I thought I didn't know. I never been to public school. I'm a private school boy. And I know that you you ain't you, you ain't gonna talk to me like that. And so him and his boys, he looks stunned. He's stunned. And so he says, What'd you hit me for? And I said, Because my name is Jonas, Bubba. And he said, he looks to me and he says, Well, we don't want your kind around here. And I said, Well, what kind would that be? Not trash? I said, because understandably, you must not know who I am. And he started to say it again. So I hit him again. Well, then a teacher comes. Fine. Well, some other kids actually came. And I had met them. And these are white kids. Because at Blue Springs South, a public school of 900, there's about maybe 30 of us all together there. And so that was my introduction in two weeks. And so I get there. The teacher gets there. He's like, he's hit me in the face. And all this stuff. And I'm like, I couldn't believe it. And when the teacher heard what happened, he pulled me back and he said, I want you to understand not everybody's like this. So move on to junior year at this school. <clears throat> I get to English class and they, we open up and there's a chapter on black English. And I get to thumbing through it and it literally opened with America singing and dancing folks. And I got to thinking to myself, I said, I said, this is why white people are racist. This, they really were teaching this. And I, and I remember the first example. It said, can I ask you a question? That was black English. And English was, may I ask you a question? So I put my hand up and I, the teacher said, and I said, have I ever asked you a question, Miss So-and-so? And she said, what do you mean? I said, well, according to this book, ask questions and I don't ask questions. And I said, frankly, and I find this offensive. And this was the first time that I ever realized that I could galvanize people. Because I said, everybody, put your, book, put your books down. And I raised up the worksheets and I said, rip your worksheets in half. The whole class rips the worksheets in half. I'm the only one. I'm, I'm, I'm the only black kid in the class. And she says, are we going to have a problem? And I say, yes, we're going to have a problem. She said, do I need to call the principal? I said, let me do it for you. This goes so far as we had FBI mediation by the end of my senior year to come to that school because we were having race wars in the parking lot. What college and did you go to? UMKC. Huh? UMKC. UMKC. Well, and then the I get, and so I get involved. I'm president of the African-American Student Union. And then they're going to try to tell I'm too light skinned to be president. What's your major? Oh, my major originally it was history. And then, as you said, I found out that it wasn't teaching history, it was teaching a story. 
And so I took African-American history and I went to journalism. And uh, shout out to Delia Gillis. She wrote a wonderful book about Kansas City Central and, and black history. She's a, a wonderful uh, professor that promotes uh, the diaspora in a very positive uh, way. She's, uh, I can't say enough about her. She's wonderful. Well, She's the know. one who helped me understand how to look at it differently, even the Negro spirituals and things of that such, because the way we are taught in other institutions, it, they're taught like as if they uh, they don't teach the significance. They teach them as things of woe, when in reality, they're ciphers. They're codes giving people direction on what to do. And well, so... And that's, that's a horse of another color. Now what I yeah, want... Yeah, and so moving on, yeah, I, I end up being two body uh, uh What... Uh, you're an ex-state uh, representative. representative. Let's... Uh, Run down how did you get into uh decide you were gonna run for state rep? Uh I had been in school, I had been student body president. Uh I had gotten that down and I had been involved with Young Freedom, Freedom Inc. uh political organization. Uh and and I've been a fly in the tell wall for many this. years. What tell me this? Uh uh how 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 far back does your family have roots in freedom? My grandfather was a founder of freedom. Well, he drew the logo. About that, and so that's what I'm saying. You, you, my audience might not know who the hell you are or anything. Uh, and see, uh, okay, I understand about your family or anything. That's run your political roots down, and then and we're going to my grandfather. And I understand that too, because when it comes to that. Some people try to live off their family, and instead I try to add to the legacy. But I am grateful for everything. My grandfather was the first black circuit judge in Kansas City. And he, along with uh, Bruce Watkins, Leon Jordan, uh, Dr. Scope, and uh, Rosemary Lowe, uh, they sat down and they formed Freedom Incorporated because the Italians up until then were controlling our community and the votes. And they uh, took it upon themselves because they understood that power in controlling your destiny is how you, is a language that everybody speaks. And when you are not afraid to wield power, that is when you make things happen. And so my grand, my, my mother, uh, my grandmother was served as the first Jackson County legislator. Uh, my mother was a, a Democratic National Committee woman. She was with Bill Clinton. Uh, the program is brought to you by the Kansas City Business Association. People like uh, the Congressman Cleaver when he was still a councilman. People like uh, Senator like Phil Cleaver. <laughs> Mary Bland. I mean, it just runs down the list. Keith Brown. There's so many. Yourself. Like, I was there always. E even when I didn't want to. As a matter of fact, my mother's always laughing because I had to work every election. I didn't get a say until I was 18. And I remember we had a big fight and I said, I'm never be in politics. As soon as I turn 18, I'm done. I'm out. I'm gone. You can't make me ever do this. And then when I won, she said, I thought you weren't going to be in politics. <laughs> and uh, and it kind of happened. What and was that uh, like down in Jeff City, you how many terms did, were you able to serve down there? I served four terms. And, and how, uh, how long is the term? Uh, two years. Two years. Two years. So you were down there. And I, only have, I only have one person run against me one time. And yet I had my vote total rise each election. Until right. the last election, I got more votes than anybody had on the east side in 20 years. I turned out 19,000 votes, which is oh, more right. than a senator. Hey, is. hey, we move, we moving on. We moving on. Uh, I'm just saying that y'all need they need to put in get on their job who's in there right now. That's what we get you know, like, That's what we get they talk about. That's why I said we gotta move, we gotta keep it moving, Jonas. Yeah. Because now, uh what I want to know, uh-uh, hell with all that. <laughs> 
What I want to know <laughs> over the last 15 years, how do you see uh, our community leadership? If you want to call uh, it leadership, and I'm not being pun, because some people say I, I understand myself. what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. It's it's almost we've got some people who are very powerful forces in their own right, but they've got an agenda. But at times it seems it's focused, but that they're fighting a battle that we already won. <laughs> and then we have other people who act as if. We our struggle is the one the struggle that y'all had, and I and I get in the fight with people my generation like, oh, you came out of Harvard, like what are you talking about? What struggle do you mean? Because they won that revolution. <laughs> we it's our charge to do the evolution. It is our charge to realize that we're not asking. We're sitting down and saying this is a solution to this problem because. We are leaders in this country. You can't take, we've led, we've been to the mountaintop. Now we're going to show y'all the way to get there too. Tell and we've this, got to stop of, asking. Tell me this, what kind of job do you think the mayor's doing? The mayor is doing what the mayor can. Under the city charter, the mayor has very little power. No, I asked you what kind of job. I didn't say what kind and of I'm job. And I'm telling you, with what he can do, he's doing. On a one to 10, let me make it simple for you. Man, on a one to 10, I'll give him an eight. All right, all right. Hey, you can't, can't, can't go wrong with an eight. That's for sure. You know, because I mean, you know, but you know, there's other council people with more power than the mayor. You know, and they well, can we all be doing that. more. Uh, tell me this. Uh, where do you see uh, our four black council people? Do you feel that they're working on the behalf of uh, black people in the greater Kansas City area? Do you think that? I can say that three of them for certain are constantly visible, constantly out there working. Well, visibility, and, uh, hold it. Visibility and results are two different things. And they get I, results as well. All right. They get on, results. Let, me, let me let me finish my statement. Uh mm -hmm. and when I say uh how are they doing, uh I'm saying what systemic uh legislation or laws or whatever that they are uh uh putting down. That's going to change. Uh, and see, and see, and that's where it comes to where some of my peers and I begin to butt heads. Because I say, look, what y'all keep talking about it when we're in the position to do that. You just have to write the law to do it. You know, we're here. Well, let's say, but, and, uh, especially and so, the state, they're saying that it's a Republican controlled legislature. And so, therefore, uh, they that that's, it hasn't been possible. Now, I've had uh, uh, I was, land. I was well. That was there. there. We talk all it. We talking about right well, now. Listen, I remember when the Republicans took over. Yeah, but I'm talking and about we, what can be done right now. I'm only and I understand. But it starts that. Sure. But see, that's an attitude that we got to understand. You got to go over to the Republicans and tell them what you want. They, well, they ain't gonna gonna listen, Jonas, Jonas, listen, listen to what I'm saying to you. Now, I've had mm -hmm. uh, Ashley Bland Love on our show twice. She's a and great she, rep. Hold it. And she but bought, she doesn't, hasn't had the proper uh, leadership. And, and she bought a rep on from St. Louis. Off yeah. Of that. Uh, and, and I'm saying they're in the trenches. Mm -hmm. And uh, but my, she said something to me that I will say that's very thing. Like, see. I came in, when I came in, they had just won. And so and she made the reference of that being as in she got brought in after the spirit had already been broken. And as in there in Soviet Russia, because when I was down in Jefferson City last time, I couldn't believe the rules that the Democrats had left in place. But that's the party's failing, not hers. Well, I'm not she no, it. listen, all of this great job. Uh, all I'm all I'm saying to you is 
that uh, when you don't have the power, you only can do so much. But, and, and but you, you have they have power. It's just they, it's it's how they tell them to use it. For instance, these Democrats would tell you we would argue for eight hours and say no, and then vote yes on the bill. That's why the Democrats now they could sue literally to have the rules changed on the floor because it it prevents them from constitutionally being able to do their job. But they don't have the leadership to, to tell them that to teach them that. And now Ashley and I've been meaning to reach out to her. She's fighting, doing the best she can, and she gets a lot done considering that they've been brought into a place where your own party says, "Sit down, don't say nothing." That is why I had a problem with them, because let's say, for instance, I want to talk about financial institutions and redlining, but they just want me to talk about how come these kids on welfare need free lunch. Not, they don't ever mention that it's not us. A minority can never be a majority. But they always try to frame it as if it's us. And I went down there, and as I've tried to tell them, I'm not asking you anything. I'm telling you, this is what I need to build Samuel Rogers. And they gave me the money, even though the Dixiecrats, I'm sorry, Democrats, didn't want me to have it. We forget they were saying integration never, segregation now, integration never. That was the Dixiecrats. And yet now we beholden to them. And I'm not saying the Republicans are any better, but understanding power is understanding, as you said, or like Janet Jackson said best, what have you done for me lately? That's right. And lately consists of yesterday. And in the yes. United States, it's almost like, what have you done for me in the last five minutes? I know what you did the last five minutes, but I forgot yes. that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like now they're trying to co-op everything. Like I saw a Sprite commercial. That said, we're going to make sure black artists are going to be heard. What? What are you talking about? We've been being heard. Like, stop it. They're see, they're trying to make it again, put us in a place where we feel subservient. Go, so speaking of family, my great uncle, Hale Woodruff, was in the, a part of the, the, the Harlem Renaissance and has artwork in the Smithsonian. And all this is hard work and done by us without giving being given an extra foot. But we have, look at you, you've built the media business. You didn't ask, you've done it. And that's what we have to understand. Nobody says you're equal. We are talking about the people responsible for Juneteenth. We think they're going to be like, oh, okay, yeah, you equal now. No, you just know you set your value. We set our value. If I tell you I own the motherfucker, excuse me. That's then, all right. That's the whole thing. Let me say this to you, and I say this to my audience. People will say to me, well, Carlos, you could have uh, used a different word, and you you be offensive, and you this, and you this. Uh, not everybody, but that's an that's, uh, opinion. And I say, you know why? Because I'm free. Uh, I create my own narrative, and if I want to cuss, I cuss. If I don't want to cuss, I don't cuss. I've got an extensive vocabulary. If I want to use impressive words, I use them. But I use what I want to use. I'm not trying to make you comfortable by not saying this or 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 tamping down. I'm trying to impress you because I because I read it. I don't want that. That's what I want to say. I don't want to say, uh, well, uh, we have a disagreement. I'm not a damn diplomat. I'm Carlos Nelson, a human being, and we born free to use, but we're in self-check. Black people are in self-check. There it is. That it is a mental, it is a mental freedom that we're talking about. We have to mentally free ourselves from this idea. Like racism wouldn't matter if you don't give a fuck. The last motherfucker who called me, who said nigga to me, I said, make sure that you top off my oil, the transmission fluids change, and make sure that the ball bearings is in right. And I went and sat and drank my coffee. See, we're in an my economic coffee. situation. Because that is what it is. 
because people to forget when Dr. King was in when when he was in town, he was not only there to negotiate for the strike. Black business owners were saying, you are going to devastate our economic power if integration fully happens, because economics is the true value of anything, even as a nation. We, they say, we, we're a consumer industry. Why in the hell would we want to be a consumer industry? That means you're a junkie. That means you waiting for the man to serve you. Then we you have two types people. of people, buyers and sellers. Yes, and we need to be, and we have to produce. Yeah. You want to be the plug. You know, we have to understand. We can teach people to make tables and chairs again. We can have people programming and coding. But it's, all, created it, but it's all political, and political means economics, and the economics transform into corporate control because the corporations control the economic because politicians were not have not been taught what politicians are in generations i was lucky i was listening a fly on the wall and yet i still read up politicians don't realize they can tell these corporations kick rocks they, you don't they, hold it. they do realize that but you got to go into what the world what what uh corporations have done to the world and especially right, because that's the new battlefield. Well, and I'm just saying, especially uh, the uh, social media. And so but those are the only American on, but listen to what I'm saying. You're right. The we, Just think about this. The old world last century, the 20th century, they spent it fighting Europe and then they copied us. Now they're a union, right? In 1980, they began dismantling what we would call is known as the New World Order. That's when they started buying up all American companies. And we let them. I mean, that's when credit started to be committed. Remember the American yeah, thing? I don't look at business. it like that. It's an international world, and America is a fading power. It's because we got, we got lazy. Like, if you own Anheuser-Busch, and you own Firestone, how could you not lie? Those families should have kept those companies in America. Do you think a Rothschild would ever sell a bank? Again, I don't she know. I'm just, that that this program lady. is not, we're not, we're not going to uh, uh, go but, to but, but, no, but that's what you're understanding. We have to have an identity as America. You know what I mean? And we're still, we're still not dealing with that because I even as you, you have them, an identity oh, as Americans, I'm trying no, to. No, because we still think white like people running shit, oh, and we no, not. The, we the, the thing that they have on Americans is that we're ugly Americans, and American doesn't have a color or religion. When you go to these other countries, you are an American. Because and American, we were bad winners, and and Americans have devastated uh, a lot of these countries. When I was coming up, it was that's so different. It was, and, and that's we, we were doing positive things in these countries, bringing water and whatever. But over the last a half century, we we've, we've been looting the countries and because they they tried to be like the British again. They tried to be an empire rather than sticking to what we were, America. And that's because a generation, the second generation, who didn't work to build those companies. All of a sudden, got greedy. That cocaine, y'all did all that booger sugar in the '80s, and it made y'all go crazy. And and all of a sudden, they selling everything because they can't. How do you beat the biggest military in the world? You don't. You shift the battlefield. And so now, 1939, America was self-sufficient. What can we had to ask for masks? What can America do? In 1980, the market, the corporate markup was 16%. That's when we still had Mo RCA, Zenith, Motorola, all these American companies, Ford, the big three. In 2016, we have a 3% corporation, but it's a 60, almost an 80% corporate markup. We got hustle. And unless we do like China, like you talking about, China don't let anybody build inside their country. Why can't we tell them to kick rocks? Capitalism means we can't. Somebody it's fill the political. hole. It's you political, but the leader has to be strong enough to know that the votes count. If I'm telling you 
that I can make lower health care and I can make sure you get a better paycheck. But you need to stick with me and not listen to them because these corporations do not have your best interest. They're not even American corporations. And we're giving them tax breaks. Meanwhile, if you go look in our Europe and all those places, they cities are beautiful. When's the last time you saw us build a big skyscraper? When's the last time we had anything done because we have we forgotten, we got greedy. When we were winning, we took our eye off the prize. And we're dealing with people who have been dealing with geopolitics for thousands of years. You understand? And we have to understand this nation building is an ongoing thing. Well, and I'm so gonna, now I'm going to close out with uh, ongoing. We've had about an hour discussion. Um, we're going to bring you back on the show uh, to talk about uh, some more political issues. I appreciate you, sir. All right. And, and because, uh, because you understand so, what this is not over. What Let me say this. What words would you have to say to our audience? Learn to think critically. When Nixon went to China, he was thinking next election. Mao was thinking next century. We have to understand when you're talking to a politician, what is your plan? Where do you see us in 10 years? What value are we bringing? And we need to learn to think critically and not be afraid of power. As you said, you use the word you use because you're expressing yourself. And we can't be afraid of a fight because conflict is therapeutic. And so if we're going to fight, then fight, you know. And then, But also, like with other people, as I said, I feel, and I need to be held accountable because I wasn't there to teach Representative Man Love and other people the necessary things they need to know to be more effective. Because I was holding my emotions to a party that misleads. The parties aren't the way to direct us, we direct them. We've got to remember this. Liberty, freedom mentally. They don't give a damn if you don't have physical bondage on, if they got your mind. If they tell you this, the sky, if they tell you and you believe everything they say, when the, even the people who built this nation said question everything, because we have to learn freedom and liberty is not for the lazy. It takes work. We're going to have to rebuild that economic engine. Yes, we're not talking. Walmart wasn't a Walmart overnight. We can start with a little shop that makes little tables and sells them. We have to work hard again. It means rolling up our sleeves, learning from what they did because they sure copied us. It's funny how Germany is president of the European Union when we fought a war to stop them from taking over Europe. They adapt, they adjust, they learn. We need to learn to adapt and adjust and study more of the world. China, who is under oppression by the British and so on and so forth, they shut down the world this year. They said, oh, you're going to accuse us of COVID? They flexed politically and they shut the world down. Power is something that the United States did not wield properly. For instance, we talk about four wars all the time when we have 52 police actions. People don't even know our own history. And as and this is our nation and there's nothing that anyone can do to say otherwise. And we have to realize that going forward. Our enemies are outside that border. And we've got land. There's 10 billion people in China and that's smaller than Missouri. You don't think they want some room to expand? They own 15 of our pork farms here. People, well, the we business and everything. We can't solve all of this tonight, but. No, uh, we can't. But we also have one more thing, too. As black folks, and as your man, you have to understand you are proof that we won. You own a media corporation that continues to grow. And I thank you for your knowledge and mentorship and things that you've done. We've got to start looking at how we won. We can't pass on pain forever. You're going to take a couple hits in a, in a fight. 
but we still standing and we still going forward. As I say in closing our programs, when you invest in your community, you're really just investing in yourself. Good night. This is brought to you by Willis Book and Vinyls.